Let's speak now to Mark uh, Denbenau, apologies for the pronunciation there, the director of the Seton Hall Law Center for Policy and Research and co-counsel for Abu Zaybanar's uh, defense. Thanks very much for joining us there, Mark. Could you first explain to us what we're seeing in these pictures here and how did your client, um, Abu Zubaydah, explain what he felt when subject to these interrogation techniques? Okay, let me start with a couple of things. First of all, you said he's allegedly a terrorist. The CIA has admitted since 2006 that he was never once a member of al-Qaeda in any way, shape, or form. The Senate Select Committee on Intelligence that you referenced concluded that he was not only not a member of al-Qaeda, but he had never engaged in any terrorist acts and that he had nothing to do with 9-11 or any such things. Everybody agrees that he was a Mujahideen fighter who viewed himself as coming to defend the, the faithful in uh, Afghanistan from the attacks by the Russians. And that's what he was, and that's undisputed now. Now, with that as background, for whatever reason, and that we haven't gotten to the bottom of that, but we're getting close, the CIA decided to take him and use him as the poster child for this torture program. The entire American torture program was designed solely to torture one man by name, and that was Abu Zubaydah. So what we end up happening here was we created a torture program to torture somebody who was never al-Qaeda, never a terrorist, admittedly so. And he sits there in Guantanamo after four and a half years in the CIA dark sites, and since then, he's been detained in Guantanamo without charges of any kind ever brought against him. So in regards to some of the treatment in your report, uh, first of all, I wanted to thank you for making, uh, giving some clarity over his background there. We do apologize for some of that misleading information. Um, but in your report, uh, you said the CIA received official assurances that he remain in isolation and incommunicado. Uh, for the remainder of his life. What kind of treatment does that have on, how, how does that, what kind of effect does that have on someone essentially? What kind of effect do these techniques have on someone? Well, actually you made two points and they're both important. On the question of what's the effect of those techniques, I don't know how you can put it into words. Uh, my report explains how they dealt with him. All 10 of the techniques approved were used on him constantly without stop for seven, the first 17 days they began. That is, he was kept awake the whole time. If you're trying to keep people awake and they want to sleep, you have to do very bad things to them to keep them awake. And that's what they did. They would hit him, they would push him into walls, they would waterboard him. He was the first person ever waterboarded. And that was part of this process. Those experiences are simply unable to be projected or explained. I see him, I saw him last week. I've seen him for eight or nine years many times a year. I know him quite well. And yet you don't sit there saying, tell me about how terrible it was. Because first, that's kind of impolite. And secondly, he doesn't especially like talking about it. But having said that, it's also important that perhaps the greatest torture of all is having endured all of that, is now chained to the floor whenever I see him in Guantanamo and without a trial and without charges. And nobody on earth can ever hear his story. Because as you mentioned, when they decided to start the torture program on him on August 2nd, 2002, he was captured on March 28th, 2002, the CIA from the torture site sent two cables to the CIA headquarters in Virginia. One said, if he dies, we want assurances that he will be cremated immediately. The second one was effectively, and if he doesn't die, we want assurances that he will be held incommunicado for the rest of his life. And that turns out to have been absolutely true. The only people he has ever been able to speak to since he was captured are his torturers, his jailers, and his lawyers. And that's primarily me. So very few people have ever had a chance to talk to him. And even our right to talk to him forbids our telling the public any of the details of what he tells us. So really, he is held incommunicado in a very dark place with no access to talking to people except the interchanges he has with his lawyer. And it's a 
pretty terrible experience. And while the torture is disgusting and the pictures are grotesque, my daughter-in-law didn't even want them in the house for fear her children would see them because they were so brutal. But nonetheless, that's what happened to him and many worse things. And what are your concerns now for the ongoing conditions that your clients are experiencing and other Guantanamo prisoners? And are the CIA techniques in line with the international law and standards around this kind of situation? Well, the CIA techniques are torture. Everybody uses the word torture. The courts in Guantanamo used to forbid those of us who are lawyers down there from ever using the word torture. They said we had to call them enhanced interrogation techniques. However, that's over with. Everybody admits they were tortured. So the we don't even use those words. He was tortured. Now, the question you're asking, what's it like down there now? The torture stopped when he came to Guantanamo in September of 2006. They brought, they closed the dark sites and they brought in varyingly described 14 to 16 people from the closed CIA dark sites. And he was one of them. And they've been held there without a trial ever since. Not a single person has ever been had a day in court in which charges were filed against them and a trial had begun. Now, there are six people who they say they're going to try, and they've been saying that for years, but no trials have started. My client, Zain Abu Zubaydah, has not even had a pretense that he will ever be charged with a crime. We've tried to bring disciplinary charges against the general prosecuting him as a lawyer for abusing his prosecutorial discretion by deliberately failing to bring charges. But n nobody will let him out because nobody wants to hear him speak. One of the significant things about your having me on this show right now is those drawings have given voice to him. It's not a complete voice, but they certainly help people realize exactly what America did in the torture program and their drawings are by the person for whom the program was designed and upon whom every single one of them was used relentlessly. Mm. So certainly a remarkable test of resilience too. I really appreciate your time on our show tonight, Mark. Thank you very much. Mark Dembo there for us.